Good evening and welcome to the Bible study here in Ballyclare Evangelical Presbyterian Church. And if you're able to join with us there this evening, that's a matter of great joy to us. And we trust that you'll know something of the presence and of the blessing of God as we seek his face together in this way. Let's turn to him now in prayer. Our Father, our God in heaven, we come to you towards the end of the day. We thank you that we can come afresh to wait upon God. We've got great promises, promises of God that you hold to, promises that you keep. And so we come with great expectation. And oh, that as we seek to visit you this night, that you would visit us. Have dealings with us, we pray. Cleanse us from our many sins and help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to read from God's word. Last week we were thinking from Hebrews in chapter 11 about Abel. I'm going to read very briefly tonight from Genesis in chapter 5, and then we'll read briefly from Hebrews and chapter 11. So let's begin in the book of Genesis. It's a long list of those who died, um, and I'm going to, to jump into that list this evening um, at verse 18. Genesis 5, verse 18, and down as far as verse 24. Let us hear God's word. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And then jumping to the book of Hebrews and to chapter 11, and I'm going to read um, from verse 1 again this evening and down as far as verse 6. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken away, so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We thank God for his word. We'll come into that very shortly. But before we do that, we're going to turn to God in prayer. So let us pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, it is our delight to turn into your holy presence this evening. We very much need you. We very much need your grace and blessing within our lives, upon our families, in the life of the church. And we need your grace and presence, O oh God, in dealing with this world in which we find ourselves. We turn to you this evening, reminding you, O oh God, of your gracious love, your long-suffering, your patience, your grace and mercy, and asking that you would deal with us with grace and mercy, with our family, in our church life, and even, Lord, in the world. We confess to you that as a, a people, as humanity, we've turned away from God, and we've failed you, and we've wandered our own way and done our own thing, and the Bible is full of those truths. It brings that home to us repeatedly. And we, we see it, Lord, in the world in which we live. Man has gone his own way. Man has done his own thing. But we come tonight to intercede for ourselves, but to intercede for the world. And to pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be merciful in these very, very difficult days. We know that you have set upon us a, a curse. It's the consequence of Adam's sin. It's brought about by our own sin. And it is, O oh God, to the end that we realize and recognize that we live in a, a broken world. Lord, we recognize that before you this evening. It is because we are inherently sinful. Lord, deal mercifully with us, we pray. We come especially 
in, in the whole um, timing of this uh, virus. And we come, Heavenly Father, uh, seeking you and praying you that you might indeed yet be merciful. We see awful scenes um, across the television um, of, of India at the moment. And we hear of other nations too. And we've seen tragedy in our own land. And perhaps we know individuals who have been very sadly and savagely um, touched by this virus. Lord, if it please you, exercise mercy. We realize that you have a lesson for the, the, the world to learn. And, oh God, we pray that that lesson would be learned and that people might come to see that they need the God who is their maker and their creator. But in wrath, remember mercy, we pray. We do ask you that you would remember Christians in those dire circumstances especially and that you would bless them and encourage them and help them and keep them, O oh God, we pray, from a sense of utter destitution and rather keep them resting and trusting in God. We pray, Lord, your blessing upon our own lives and upon the lives of our family and our, our church too. We pray, Lord, that you would remember us in these days. We are conscious, Heavenly Father, they're not easy days to be living in. And we need your grace that we may persevere, that we may endure, that we may see the grace of God, that we may know that God is on the throne. So help us, Heavenly Father. We need your blessing and grace upon our lives. We pray that you would remember all who stand in need. Some of our number are really not well. Others, Heavenly Father, um, are concerned about loved ones and have other problems in, in their lives. Some are facing challenging days this week and, and things that um, have come. Uh, Lord, we, we just commend each other to you. We pray especially for our young people and that you would help them um, at a time of testing and examination and bless them and encourage them, we pray. Grant, O oh God, that they may know your help and blessing and your encouragement. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you would cheer them along. We ask you that you would come and meet with us tonight in your word. We're conscious as we meet, but we realize that we have sister congregations who will also be meeting this evening. And we pray that you would do them good and bless them and encourage them. We pray that your word would go forth and that your people would be edified, built up in their most holy faith and stirred to walk with God. And especially in the face of troublous and difficult times. So Lord, hear our prayer. Forgive and cleanse us our many, many sins. Grant us the fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom, and hear and bless us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, we've been looking for some time now. It's a good six months into the book of Hebrews. It's a wonderful book. It's a very practical book. Um, it's centered really around a, a group, we don't know how big, but a group of um, Christians who had begun in life as uh, folk who were of a Judaistic background, and um, they've, they've been converted. Wonderful to think that they had been converted. They started out well, and that the book of Hebrews tells us that, but as time has gone by, they'd found the Christian life difficult, and persecution, trouble had come their way, and it would seem that uh, it's very likely that that trouble and difficulty had come from their own background, from Judaistic sources, from Jewish people. The writer of the book of Hebrews is trying to help them. And he wants them to see that the, the ultimate, the answer of that Old Testament Jewish faith is the Lord Jesus Christ. They've come to see the one who is the fulfillment of all that was promised. And they've been, um, you know, walking with God. Now they're doubting. Now they're questioning. Um, pressures from men are causing them to doubt and to question. But he wants to urge them on. And really, the book of Hebrews is all about them seeing the uh, wonder of the person of Jesus Christ, his work, all that he's done, the fact that he's the fulfillment of all that Old Testament promise. This word faith is important, and it's always important to the Christian life, isn't it? Um, it is that we, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And faith is the subject then, very directly. It's been there right the way through the book, but very directly in chapter 11. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we're told about faith in the God who created. We only know um, that God created through his word, and we believe his word. The evolutionists 
um, the Big Bang theorists and all the rest of it can say what they like. But we know what the Bible says. The Bible is God's word, and the Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He, he made the heavens and the earth in the space of six days, the Bible tells us. And that's what we believe. That's the truth that we hold to. We've seen Abel. We saw that last week. Abel is a, a great example of faith. A man who took God, his word, seriously. He'd heard of the fall. I imagine he'd seen, I suppose, something of the fall in terms of a fallen world um, in what he saw all around him. But he'd, he'd heard from his mother and father. And he'd come wonderfully to a place of saving faith. And he, he was taking God seriously. God's word spoke of coming to God, but only by means of a sacrifice. And when Abel came to approach God, he came by means of a sacrifice. He took God seriously. His brother, his elder brother Cain, who really to the family was a source of much greater hope, they expected that God was going to do something through this man because of the promise that God made in chapter 3 and verse 15 of Genesis. Um, he came apparently worshipping, but not really. And he certainly wasn't listening to God. And he brought of the things that he'd been growing um, in his garden. And he felt that these should win the favor of God. God was not pleased with these things. And so consequently, Cain is rejected, but Abel finds a place with God. It results then in Cain um, killing his brother and so on. But the essence of the story that Abel believed God. This evening we come to um, another slightly eerie figure, I suppose, um, someone that we don't think about every day, perhaps, um, and his name is Enoch. We read about him um, there just a few minutes ago from Genesis in chapter 5. Enoch. Three headings. Enoch, his example of faith. Enoch, his exercise of faith. Enoch, his emboldening of faith. Enoch, to begin with, his example of faith. And what a great example Enoch is. Enoch his exercise of faith. And we'll think about how it was that he exercised his faith. And then Enoch, the emboldening of faith. We're to be stirred by this man. These Hebrew Christians were to be stirred as they thought of Enoch. To begin with then, Enoch, his example of faith. Now we've come to this great chapter of faith. We picked up on Abel last week as someone who um, probably wouldn't be our first contender um, in listing out the list of Old Testament saints by uh, faith. And that's probably true also when we come to Enoch. You, you hear, don't you, of um, some of these Old Testament names coming back into more modern circulation and children are getting named, um, you know, after, um, you know, Old Testament figures um, and, and so on. Noah at the moment is one of those names that's up there in, in, in the, the sort of hit parade. You know, it's, it's up the league. I think it's second um, at the moment. Noah, Noah is up there. I'm not sure about Enoch. I don't think Enoch's name is, is anywhere up there. Not, not a lot of children are getting named um, Enoch at the moment. Um, history, of course, um, and especially in our day, can write people in and out of name and fame. The whole woke phenomenon um, seems set on discarding famous names from history. Well, Enoch is remembered for his walking with God. We live in a very much, and you've often heard me say this, very much a, 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 a name and fame day. It's a day when people crave um, name, when they crave fame. Um, young people especially are uh, um, stirred by these things and there are examples set before um, the younger generation and and what do those um, examples urge well it might be that you be a famous football star it might be that you're I don't know this isn't politically correct now but that you be a, a rather shapely but um, slender model that you be a stunning actor or actress or that you be a you know, a very accomplished musician that people, um, you know, long to, to hear perform and so on. Um, we made the point with Abel last week that um, really Abel was a nobody. As far as the world was concerned, really, Abel was a nobody and Abel is a nobody. 
and people remember Cain and but God remembers Abel and the same is true then when it comes to Enoch God remembers Enoch and Enoch's name may not be up there with Noah <laughs> we'll come to Noah but um, his name may not be up there with with Noah's name but his name is up there with God and what do we read about this man? By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. What was Enoch known for? Well, it wasn't that he was a great goal scorer. It wasn't that he was a, a very famous musician. It wasn't um, that he made powerful portrayal before um, folk or something like that. It wasn't for his elegance. It wasn't even for his singing. I don't know whether Enoch had a good voice or not, but it wasn't for his singing. What was Enoch famous for? Well, it was that he walked with God. Enoch didn't discover penicillin. He didn't split the atom. He didn't master powered flight like the Wright brothers. He simply walked with God. Now, you might wonder, is that all he did? Are you telling us that Enoch is famous tonight, that he's here in the Hall of Faith um, because that he walked with God? Is that what you're saying? Well, yes, it is. Think, um, think of that. Think of these Hebrew Christians and of the day that Enoch lived in. You see, he walked in what was a difficult day with God. These Hebrew Christians were to walk in a difficult day with God. We, in a difficult day, are to walk with God. Now, we need to be careful to emphasize what Enoch, Enoch's day was like. This was a day when Eden and all its joys had been lost, when death had become clear. So I didn't read there this evening from all of Genesis in chapter 5. But of course, Genesis in chapter 5 is that chapter that lists out um, the, the sort of family of Adam. But we read time and again, though they lived long, long years, Methuselah um, lived, you know, Enoch's uh, son lived to be 969 years. His father had lived, I think it was 962 years. So there were long livers here long long livers but eventually they died and these are the, the days Genesis in chapter 5 is the, the chapter if you like that is listing out for us that solemn consequence to the fall of Adam it may um, seem that God had said that in the day that they ate of the fruit they would die and that was a long long time coming but the day did come spiritual death came immediately and physical death followed unquestionably. Death was becoming clear and the, the fallout from the fall was being felt. And it was seen there in Adam's family, if you like, being listed out through Seth um, for us there in Genesis in chapter 5. But it's also being felt in Cain's family. Cain, of course, um, turned his... Uh, heel on God and turned away from God and walked away and went and built a city and named it after his son. We read chapter 4 verse 16, then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden and Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. There was pride here. There was a, a feeling of I'll do it my way here in Cain. To, to Enoch, um, a different Enoch, of course, was born Irad, and Irad begot Mahujiel, and Mahujiel begot Mahushiel, and Mahushiel begot Lamech. Lamech's that arrogant man who took to himself two wives and who boasted before them, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I've killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Forget about God, because I'll sort myself out here. And if anybody touches me, I don't need God to help me. Forget about God. I'll sort myself. And you see if I don't get even with him. And that's the desperate situation that we find 
um, mankind in. Of course, following that, we read Adam knew his wife again. Verse 25, she brought a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me, which is what the name Seth, of course, means to be appointed. Here was society. Um, they've become very able in all sorts of different things. We won't look at the detail of that this evening. But they've become um, very able in, in um, making their way through life. And this man, Lamech, in many ways, sums up their stridency, their arrogance, their pride. I'll do it my way, was the song. I'll make a profit. I'll make a go of it. I'll make money. I suppose, really, you know, to put that in, in modern terms. And it, it's there in all their opposition and in all, in all their threatening. And really, that, that opposition and threatening comes to the godly um, believing line. We might like to think um, that we could live in um, smooth and easy days. I'm sure the Hebrew Christians would have loved to have lived in smooth and easy days when things go well, when faith perhaps feels strong. But... The reality is that time and again we find ourselves living in difficult days. And that's um, repeatedly through history been the lot of God's people to live in difficult days. James writes, doesn't he? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. These folk um, that James is writing to needed to exercise faith. These Hebrew Christians needed to exercise faith. Enoch needed to exercise faith. These were not easy days. These were days when to be a child of God was ridiculed and mocked. Here's Peter in those famous verses in 1 Peter chapter 1 where he writes about the salvation that belongs to the children of God. He says in verse six, Verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The point is, it wasn't easy for Enoch. It wasn't easy for these folk. It's not easy for us either. But Enoch walked and kept walking with God. He held tight. And what we've got in verse 6 is really a commentary, isn't it? On, on, it's on the general, but it's against the background of Enoch. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The point is that Enoch kept tight hold on the promises of God in, in, in the face of all the difficulty, all the setbacks, all the negativity, all the opposition that was facing him. He was a, a man who stuck it out, who walked with God through the thick and thin. Now, there's something said about Enoch in the book of Jude. Chapter 1, there is only the, the first chapter in Jude, verse 14 where we read, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. These are difficult men, uh, people who opposed and so on, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them for all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch lived in a difficult day. Now, we're not seemingly given too much detail there in Genesis, but evidently Jude, either through Genesis or in some other directly revealed way to him, knew these details. These people that he's um, likening to Enoch's day of opposition are described in verse 12. These are spots in your love feasts, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up to their own shame, wandering stars, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, those were the people in, in Jude's day. He's writing to another group of people. But they, you know, in, in, in essence, 
um, where the people that this man Enoch was speaking about, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment. Now, that's the position that um, this man uh, Enoch held. It was a day when death was taking its hold, a day when Abel was long since dead. It was a day when Cain and his wicked family were flourishing. And of course, that will come to its fullness um, when we come into Genesis in chapter 6 and the story of Noah and how man's heart is completely set against God. Things had become increasingly difficult. Life for a believer had become increasingly problematic. It was a day when it looked as though the good lost out and the evil prospered. You can see it in those words of Lamech, can't you? They, they were making strides. They were getting ahead. But life was difficult for those who were godly. But in that situation, Enoch stood firm. It was a great test of his faith when all around everyone was so difficult, so awkward, so negative. That's where faith hangs out. That's where faith is to be found. Faith holds firmly to God. When everything is saying no, faith holds on to God's yes. It holds tight to God. Think of the wording of that famous Psalm 73 that we've often um, alluded to. And here's Asaph, and he gets discouraged, and he's overwhelmed. He tells us um, in verse 16, when he thinks about the the sort of marauding power of the wicked around him. He says, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. He was overwhelmed by it. These Hebrew Christians were overwhelmed until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. And really that's the understanding that um, Enoch had because he's, he's talking about the Lord coming, you see, in his judgment. I understood, I understand their end is the thought. And he hung on. Um, Asaph was hanging on. These Hebrew Christians were to hang on. We're to hang on. Knowing that one day the judge is coming. And whatever's been happening, it's going to come before the judge. It's a sober thought, isn't it? It's a sober thought. Enoch, his example of faith. But Enoch, secondly, his exercise of faith. We're told, aren't we, it's important to exercise. It's, it's important for your heart. It's important for your, for your bones. It's important for, for all your bodily systems, really, for the working of your body. It's important for your muscles um, and probably a whole list of other um, things as, as well. It's good to, to try and keep your weight under control, but it's important in, you know, in retaining your, your abilities and, and your capabilities. It's important to be on the move, to be doing things, to be exercising. The body is meant to do things. Enoch, we're told, exercised. It was his daily exercise. He walked with God. It was a pretty straightforward, um, ordinary exercise. He didn't do weights as such. <laughs> Um, obviously, we're using a picture here, but he didn't do weights. It wasn't running for speed or distance. It was a pretty ordinary kind of exercise, really. He walked with God. It's summed up in verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For him who comes to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It's summed up there. Um, but it reflects, really, on what we've got in the book of Genesis. And back, um, as we read it there, um, a few minutes ago in chapter 5 and in verse 24. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. He simply walked with God. Now, let's be clear. There, there are others in that um, list there in, in uh, Genesis and chapter 5 who were also believers. Um, they also evidently were the Lord's. There's a wonderful overlapping. We also need to remember that when you, when you think about Genesis in chapter 5, um, that uh, you, you know, Enoch was to, to know his great, great, great grandfather, Adam. Um, he was to overlap with Seth. 
that's wonderful, isn't it, in, in natural life, that children can know their grandparents, that the grandparents, that children can even know their great grandparents. What a wonderful thing. But th- this was extended much further. And so, you know, the, 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 the faith that was there in Adam was related to, or relayed, um, rather, to, to, to Enoch. He was a man who walked with God. There was something about Enoch that walked him out. The commentator, he puts it like this. He says, Enoch was not a spectacular man, but he walked with God. Now, let's be clear. The only way for any person to enter heaven is through um, the righteousness that is on God's standard. The only way for us to enter heaven is through the righteousness that is reckoned, that is counted to us. That's the only way of salvation, the only way of faith. And we know, of course, that that righteousness comes to us. It's made available to us through our Lord Jesus Christ, who perfectly lived before God, but who was put to death on the cross, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, the scripture says. We know that in Abraham, we read in Genesis in chapter 15 and verse 6, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And the only way that... Um, has ever been for for man to be able to come into the presence of God is through faith. That's the great um, tenet, really, isn't it, of what we've got in Romans in chapter 4. What shall we say, then, about Abraham, our father, um, that he's found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast of, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was a moment, actually, of unbelief in Abraham, if you, you, you know the story, but he listens to God and he believes again, and it's accounted to him for righteousness. It wasn't a, a great moment, really, of his faith. He was doubting God, but his faith is revived. So there's nothing there to boast of in terms of Abraham. No, it was that, that righteousness was counted to him. It was counted to him. And the example that follows David And the psalm that is quoted there in Romans in chapter 4, Psalm 32, a psalm of uh, David's contrition following his wrong with Bathsheba. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. It's all about being counted right. Now, let's be clear about that. The only way to be made right with God is through being counted right. But Enoch's faith was worked out in his walking with God. His walk, his life was with God. That's always going to be the case, that um, if there's an imputed righteousness to be justified by faith, we can look and expect an imparted righteousness. A righteousness that God brings. So there's the truth of justification, imputed righteousness. But there's the truth of sanctification, that steady working of God the Spirit. We spoke on Sunday evening there about the fruit of the Spirit and especially in relation to gentleness. If there's an imputed righteousness, we, we look for and expect an imparted righteousness. God makes his children more and more holy. That will be culminated, of course, in the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're told, aren't we, in 1 John chapter 3, when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And suddenly, in a moment, sin will be banished, and we will be made like Jesus. Wonderful day. But even in the here and now, there is that expectation that there'll be a changed life, a walking with God. Later on in Hebrews, we'll read in chapter 12 um, that without holiness, no man will see God. What will not see God without holiness? It's a pretty strong, powerful statement, isn't it? What we see here in Enoch is what we see, of course, in the story of Job. Um, It's not that Job was without sin and time demonstrated that, but when God thought about Job. This is what he said. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? 
This man walked with God. Chapter 2, verse 3. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. And still he holds fast to his integrity, though you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. God delights in his children walking carefully with him. He rewards those, says verse 6, that diligently seek him. Entry to heaven is only on the basis of grace. It's only on the basis of a reckoned righteousness, an imputed righteousness. But God delights in the obedience of his children. And what we've got here surely speaks of a steady walk. One of the reasons that exercise is important, and especially for older people, is that, that business really of steadiness, keeping your muscles um, active, keeping your whole body moving, keeps um, a steadiness um, on your, your feet. And, um, you know, we all like to sit down, uh, of course, but, um, you know, it's good to be moving about because it, it helps us to retain little ones. You see them learn to walk and, and it comes. Well, e even as life proceeds, we need to be active. We need to be moving to, to keep that uh, steadiness, uh, uh, as it were, of life. What we have in Enoch's life is surely a steadiness. He's no sort of superstar just um, waiting to, you know, come... Um, crashing down. No, you could almost say that Enoch was boring. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But he was steady. He steadily walked with God. Isn't that something that God looks for? Well, of course it is. Think of the, the language of Hebrews and um, chapter 4. And we're told there of the whole purpose of the, the ministry. And we're told in Hebrews and chapter 4, down at verse 11, he himself gave some to the apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of uh, deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, even Christ. The point being, you see, that God looks for his children to grow and to become steady. Well, Enoch had grown and he was steady. There's a diligence about this man. There's a steadfastness about this man. There was a good habit about this man. Now, obviously you can, you can have bad habits. You can always be late. You can so often be grumpy. You can be someone who's constantly getting themselves into trouble. But Moses is telling us from Genesis that Enoch was a well-known walker with God. He was forever seeking God. He was forever seeking God. God delights in that. God delights in that. And we know that um, this man Enoch was someone who spoke up for God. He prophesied about these men, Jude 14. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints. This man walked steadily. Um, and his walk, in many ways, was the proof and demonstration um, of what he said with his tongue. There was, there was no disparity here. Um, you, you know, there was no incongruity here. The, the, the man was in word and in action. There was a concurrence there that the, the two things went hand in gloves. They were, they were together. This man walked steadily, but how do we explain it? Well, it was that root of faith being worked out. There is a follow-on to truly believing God, isn't it? That wonderful um, uh, turning verse in, in Romans in chapter 1 that we're forever quoting, but it's a wonderful, wonderful verse. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be being transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you uh, may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Christian is someone whose life is being changed. How do we explain what was going on in this man's life? How do we explain his steady footing? He was tapped into life. 
with God. We've seen in recent days these desperate, um, tragic pictures coming from India. And the, the desperate hunt um, for oxygen. Um, you know, you see people dashing about and trying to get hold of an oxygen ta uh, tank for um, some family member. And they're, they're desperate. It's a very difficult um, series of pictures to, to watch, isn't it? We need the oxygen of faith in the harsh and bitter climate of ungodliness in which we live. The commentator, he puts it like this. He says, a walk with God has its own atmosphere and brings its own strength into a world which was never made, which, uh, which rather has never made um, a life of faith easy for the believer. Let's try that one again. Um, a walk with God has its own atmosphere and brings its own strength into a world which has never made a life of faith easy for the believer. Enoch wasn't marching to the world's tune. He wasn't, um, you know, keeping in step. I rewatched um, the Prince Philip's um, Duke of Edinburgh's funeral again there the, the, the other day, and you, you see them all marching in step and, and so on, on, on amazing. Um, but Enoch wasn't marching in, in, in step to the world's tune. He wasn't following their beat. No, this man was walking with God. He was in step with God. Enoch, his example of faith. Enoch, his exercise of faith. But Enoch, thirdly, his emboldening of faith. And that's ultimately the reason that Enoch is in this list of Old Testament saints of faith. We have his example before us. We have his exercise before us. And it all serves to embolden our faith. And, and of course, the striking thing about Enoch is that Enoch was taken. Enoch is an extraordinary figure in that he didn't see death. He was translated on a par with what we see in Elijah. Elijah carried away in that chariot of fire. And so think about it. Moses died. Um, Joshua died. Samuel died. David died. John the Baptist died. Paul died. They all faced death. But this man was spared. And you say, well, why? Um, was he somehow better? Well, no, no. He was just a sinner saved by grace like you and I, I trust. We can't suggest that Enoch was better than Abel or anybody else on the list of um, Old Testament saints of faith. No, but he was a great and well-known example of walking with God in the face of great difficulty, a clear demonstration of um, Bible-believing faith, and so God took him. And why? To make clear, this is wonderful, to make clear what happens to those who believe and follow him. Just as you see, Elijah, in the same way, is an example. It's a pledge to God's servants, to the prophets, to those who bring God's Word. It's a pledge to God's servants in the face of great difficulty that God is able to whisk them away. The chariot of fire, as it were, is all but waiting for them. It's a pledge. It's a promise. It's a wonderful, wonderful truth. Think of the timing. Genesis in chapter 5 records a long, long string of deaths. Abel had long since died. Adam dies when he's 930 years old. And Enoch is taken in the year 987. It's 57 years after Adam. It's 53 years before Seth dies. Go and do the arithmetic for yourself there. You see what we've got here? Adam dies. There's... Time for sober thinking amongst the people of God. You know, you could have been completely thrown by Adam's death. You could have thought, well, there's no point. But they continued on. Enoch continued on. And after 57 years, he's carried away to heaven and glory. God takes him. And that's 53 years before Seth 
dies. God's timing is perfect. Death comes leaving his people time to think, time to get the message. Um, rather like you know, what we were talking about there on Sunday morning in terms of the curse. There's the message to bring home to us. There's a problem. Well, the message of death came home, but in the midst of that message of death, God breathes, as it were, life because Seth is carried into glory. And there's time to get the message. But before Seth dies, here's the promise in what happens to Enoch. Same with Elijah. Um, Elijah comes before a long, long list of Old Testament prophets, um, even have to speak against Israel and Judah. But the pledge in Elijah, in his being carried away to these dear Old Testament prophets, is that though they even faced great opposition and they were at the end of their wit, as Elijah was at the end of his wit, and though they faced death and the threat was made, of course, against Elijah, and though they die, and some of them, many of them did, as far as God was concerned, they were carried away in a chariot of fire. And so make the point, faith is not vain. Faith is no vain thing. It's no vain thing to hang on God. The world may laugh. Circumstances may cry out against faith. These dear Hebrew Christians, they felt they were up against it. This was too difficult. This was too problematic. Even sometimes, you know, the poor example of other Christians can, you know, leave the believer wondering if it's worth it. You can be tripped by the poor example of other Christians. Um, but there's every reason to endure because God rewards those who diligently seek him. Poor old um, Elijah, of course, was to feel the awfulness of his day. He was to feel the great difficulty of his day. It's recorded for us um, there in 1 Kings in chapter 19 and verse 4. It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. He'd had enough. He'd had enough. And he felt, what a waste. There's no purpose to this. No, that's not right, says God. And he whisks him in a way in a chariot of fire. And Enoch is whisked away into the presence of God. What a help. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. His life wasn't easy. He'd stood up. Um, God had in some way spoken to him. He had things to say about the judgment day, and he said them. He was faithful. He was true. He kept walking. His life consistently kept walking with God. And the comfort to us that God took him. These Hebrew Christians were to be comforted. We're to be comforted. It's not a waste of time. God sees it all. He knows it all. He knows the truth. You know, man can spin it out. You get sick and bite all, don't you? Man can spin it out. They can spin a story. God knows the truth. And God took this man. And the believing child of God is to be encouraged that God cares for and remembers and will whisk away his children at the right moment, at the right point. He not walk with God or was not, for God took him. And let me say too, just as we close, that heaven belongs to those who, like Enoch, believe and walk with God. You know, the thought is out there, isn't it, in the, in the world? And people seem to think that whatever you do in life, you know, you go to heaven. He's at peace. He's at rest now. The Bible doesn't tell us that. The Bible doesn't tell us that. That's men. No, heaven belongs to those who, like Enoch, believe and walk with God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for time to look into your holy word. We thank you that we can wait upon the Lord. We can renew our strength. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us and remember us through these words tonight. Help us to remember Enoch. Help us to be stirred in our lives by him. Our prayer in Jesus' name.